Good afternoon. Sorry for uh, the little delay, some uh, technical difficulties. Yes. Uh, like the chief said, my name is Julio de Figueroa, or Julio de Figueroa. Either way is fine. Half Portuguese, half Puerto Rican, so don't matter. I've been with the sheriff's office on my uh, ninth year now. From my ninth years in the department, I've been dealing with gangs for seven. Uh, this is basically my bread and butter over all my other duties in the department. I've been, just a little background about myself. Uh, like I said, I started in the sheriff's department back in 98, end of 98, and, uh, beginning of 99. Uh, started at the Astrid facility. I was in the special operations team for five years before I started doing the investigations division. Uh, I've done undercover work. I've done and if everything you can possibly think of uh, seeing out there in the law enforcement, I've done it. Uh, but my specialty is gangs. I grew up in a good neighborhood in Puerto Rico, a good family, but I, I loved this since I was a kid, so I, it's kind of in, in my blood. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to give you here is uh, basically a kind of basic knowledge that we give to our officers when they go through the academy. Uh, I go around the state, give training to a lot of different departments, and each community, each county has their own different problems. Difference here, like in a college community, uh, I've done it in, in UMass, I've done it for the chief before in a, one of his other campuses here in Attleboro, uh, is that you get people from every area. So the basic information you're going to get here is the basic, is the same information that you're going to get in any other uh, department, any police department, but I actually centralize it what we deal in the county. You guys probably get a lot of people here from New Bedford, uh, Fall River. So it doesn't matter because you don't see anything in the hallways, any graffiti, or maybe after you see the presentation, you're going to say, well, I've seen that before. I've seen that before. Well, I'm just going to give you an idea of what to look for and what to do when you see something like that, you know, kind of warning signs and stuff. In corrections, Sheriff Department, we have two divisions. We have a law enforcement division, and we have a correction division. We deal with all the prisons in, in the county. Corrections, we call them security threat groups. Why we call them security threat groups? Because they don't have to be from a specific gang or a specific identified group to become a, 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 a threat to our security. Gangs is basically the street name that they give to, the to, to all the street gangs or the street groups that are out there. Basically, we're going to give you a definition of what we have as, an, as a gang or a security threat group. A little bit of history, so you guys see how long we've been dealing with gangs. Uh, some identifiers, early warning signs, which is very important, especially if you have kids, you don't see why it's very important. Type of gangs that we deal with, and we deal with a lot of gangs. Uh, active gangs that we have in Bristol County. This PowerPoint is probably about a year old. I have to update it. There's a lot of things in here that are there and are not there. I mean, it just, it, it changes. Every month, every month there's something new coming out with these gangs. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, graffiti that we've seen around the area. First of all, I, this is what I ask everybody. What is a gang? By the way, I'm very interactive, so join in. I've got to watch my language a little here because I'm on video. So wh what's a gang? Anybody? An idea. What is a gang? What's your definition of a gang? That's, well, that's very good. And we should have, have you in the meeting that we had when, we came, when the investigators came up with this definition that I'm going to show you. The definition that I'm going to show you is the definition that we use in the in, uh, National Gang Investigators Association. 
There was never a definition in the United States about what a gang, what's a specific gang. And they decided in one of the conferences that they did in Las Vegas to sit down all these investigators from the state, and they asked them, two senators came on, and they say, hey, we need a definition from what is a gang. And you gave the perfect definition that that's, that's what we should go with, which that's exactly what it is. But you had 200 people in a room, and we came up with this little stupid definition. Three or more people who share unique name, mark, or symbols, who also associate together on a regular basis, okay? And they have a chain of command. I mean, they, they're, they're pretty organized. So far, so good, right? What do you think is the biggest gang? Can anybody tell me? Any gang. What's the biggest gang that you think is out there? That's, that is true. That is one of the biggest gangs. But I have a different opinion on that. That's the biggest gang. Law enforcement is the biggest gang. Law enforcement and the military. We are the biggest gang. Look at the definition. Three or more people who share unique name, marks, and symbols. No matter where department you are, you're either wearing blue or you're wearing a collar close to blue. We we'll associate together on a regular basis. Don't tell me you guys that are officers in here don't hang out once in a while. We're always hanging out together. And we have a chain of command. Chief sitting down right here. So I call the law enforcement community and the military the biggest gang. There's a difference, though. A gang engaged in antisocial, unlawful, or criminal activity to further the gang's social or economical status. That's the difference. All departments, we have bad apples. We cannot judge all, all our people in our police departments of the bad apples we have. That's the difference between our law enforcement community gang and a street gang. Basically, the criminal activity. Corrections is a little bit different. Our definition specifically mentions gangs, group gangs or inmate organizations that have been determined to act in concert, and they pose a threat or a potential threat to the security of the staff and the public safety and the early operation, uh, running operation of a correctional institution. Basically, they disturb all the time, and we have those. They don't have to be from a specific gang. Let's say you have 10 guys from New Bedford that they don't associate with no gang, but they associate together in one of our units. We want to target them. We want to know what they're doing because they're going to start acting up and they'll do crazy stuff. And then it's more paperwork for me. I don't like that. I don't like paperwork. And they prey upon another inmate. You see that a lot. A little bit of history. Since the 1770s, gangs became a problem in the United States. Why do you think that? Why we had problems since the 1770s in the United States as gangs? Yes, ma'am. That's true. That is correct. Back then, that is correct. Uh, most Second of them were Irish. The, the, the immigration people coming to United because States. Everybody was coming over here. They had no Second clue fact, was around no there. Law most press. of the time, that's what well, happened. No cops back then when everybody started coming over. They said, "Well, you got a Spanish everybody gang, you got an Irish gang, you got this and that." Well, yeah, Juvenile they danced together because they had the same culture. All of these kids came on the boat with their parents. Their parents died on the way over here. They were all by themselves. They decided, "Well, you look at it right now." Survived one way or the other. Totally different conflict. They banded together. Now you have members, like you mentioned earlier, specifically organized gangs. Started in large cities across the East Coast, specifically New York. You get Puerto Ricans. You got the Dominicans, the biggest, you got the black gangs. guys. Back. They don't care anymore. It's all about numbers. How many numbers you can have in your gang? Because number show power. Some of the gangs that included back in the day. Pug Ugly, the Dead Rabbits, they wore red stripes on their pants. Uh, Roach Guards, they wore blue stripes on their pants. And the 40 Thieves, they called themselves that because they were professional murders. But if you look at it, these specific two gangs over here, the Dead Rabbits and the Roach Guards. They were red stripes and blue stripes. Local gangs over here were the same colors. The Bloods were the red, the Crips, or the Gangster Disciples, they were the blue. So even back then in the 1770s, 1800s, they were still identifying themselves of the same colors that we have right now. History repeats itself. Uh, by 1825, in New York City, they figured out that they had a gang problem. They said, well, we got to do something about it. By 1950s, African-American and Hispanics 
and white gangs were prevalent in all areas across the nation. Again, everybody started migrating to the United States in the 50s. Okay? It wasn't until 1953 that the city of New York created the first cur youth curfew. Why they did that? Because they had so much problems with youth hanging around that they figured, well, we've got to do something about it. So it took them over 100 years to start what they call, well, they didn't call it a gang unit back then, but they started a unit to deal with the young, the, the youth people, so they can control them and stop it about their crimes and stuff like that. And that's one of the things that happens. Something has to happen in a period of time for government to acknowledge that they have a gang problem. Government will never acknowledge that, because if they do, they'll figure, well, the mayor is scared, or the governor is scared. Why is he doing that? We don't need to vote for somebody like that. So it's become a political problem. Same decade, organized prison gangs started to form. Now, why do you think that in the same decade, in the 50s, prison gangs started to form? Why? That's right. Law enforcement came in and they say, hey, guess what? You're a gangbanger? You're coming with me. Same thing. They went back inside. What did they do? They started hanging out together. Hey, you know, strength by number. They started building their gangs. Then it became a problem for correctional facilities, sheriff's departments, everybody. People ask me, whoa, why do they join the gangs? There's many reasons why they join gangs. It's just a few. Lack of identity. That's like number one. A lot of the kids that are loners, a lot of the gang bangers will target them. They need to feel important. They want to feel like they belong to something. Companionship. They don't have it at home. They have it with the gang. That's what they offer them. That's how they're willing to mean. Uh, lack of parental involvement. Sad to say, but 80% of the gang members on studies come from broken homes. One single parent. Mother or father. But it's just one single parent. Sometimes not even both. Low self-esteem, okay? Peer pressure, it's very important, especially in school. You got a lot of these kids that, they're good kids in school, good kids in your house, but then their friends in school are hanging out with all these gangbangers. So what do they do? Gotta fit in somehow. They start joining the group. Sense of security, correctional facilities, sometimes even in the neighborhoods in the area. They use this. Hey, if you don't join my gang, I'm going to start beating the crap out of you. Every time you come out of school, you're going to get beat up. I'm going to do everything possible to make your life miserable. So before they get beat up, they're going to join the gang. Because why? I'm a gangbanger now. I got security. They're going to protect me, no matter what. That's what happens. Again, protection. In prison, that's a big for us. You always watch who's doing what, how much money somebody has in their inmate accounts, how they're getting the money, who's sending them the money, because sometimes people pay for protection. Instead of paying for protection, they just join the, the gang. Well, how do they become members? It's a process. Of course, it goes to initiation process. They can get beaten or jumped in. They get beaten or jumped in for a specific amount of time, or uh, whenever the, the, the gang leader wants them to get beat up for. Uh, then it starts progressing after that. Armed robberies, drive-by shootings. City of New Bedford right now, we only had, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, 13 calls for the year for drive-by shootings. Nobody had got shot, but just shots fire call. Last year, at the same time, there were probably 78 uh, radio calls of uh, shots fire. Why in the city of New Bedford is kind of a little bit under control? Because of law enforcement. New police, uh, police chief went over there and decided to open a gang unit, and the gang unit has been working with a lot of other gang units. Federal government is in. We have a federal uh, task force, uh, the gang task force, so there's more police presence targeting gangs than it was before. So all these guys are scared. And what happened is, I get the problem, because all the cops are out there picking up these people, and they come to my jail. And once they're in prison, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to do the same thing they do in the street. So the street is calmer, but the prison is acting up. Yesterday in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, we had a five of 15 guys beating each other up. Guys from New Bedford, guys from Fall River. Two different gangs. The guys from Fall River that were Crips were hanging out with the New Bedford that were Crips. The other guys that were Bloods from New Bedford started acting up with everybody. It's pretty bad. Four guys went to the hospital. So it keep, you know, if it's cold in the street, it's hot in the prison. If it's cold in the prison, it's very hot in the street. 
The other reason that we don't have a lot of drive-by shootings, 12 of suspect shooters in the city, including Full River, are in prison right now, waiting trial. Uh, rape an innocent victim, this is part of an initiation process. We had one case that we didn't, couldn't figure it out. This guy was charged with rape. He was in the prison in regular population. Nobody said anything after we did some investigation. He was ordered to rape somebody to prove himself because he was coming from Boston. He wasn't from this area. He's doing 15 to life right now. Uh, blessed in, meaning that I am a leader of a gang. My brother comes from whatever, and we want to initiate him. Well, I can say, hey, he doesn't have to go to none of this process. He's blessed to come in to be in the gang. Females. That's the new trend, been going on for the last 10 years. They get sexed in. MS-13, MS-13, a female that wants to become a member of MS-13, she needs to endure a rape by 13 members for 13 minutes. So they basically, they put her in a room and they have 13 guys walking in one after the other for 13 minutes and rape her. Literally, rape her. I have a video of an initiation and it sucks, it's nasty, it was uh, the, uh, immigration officers uh, confiscated on a raid that they did. They picked up a bunch of guys and we use it for training. I'm not going to show you that video, but we do have it. We use it for training so people can see what happens, especially for our officers. Uh, murder. That's the number one. There's a one point that the more murders that you were a suspect of, the more you looked like you were going to be higher in the chain. And it's not true. The gangs are very organized. You may have a guy in the street that he may be a suspect on four murders, but guess what? That's just his job. He has no rank. That's his job. They pay him to do that. Okay? But that's part of the initiation. Hey, go shoot this guy. You know? If you kill somebody, you're going to show commitment to that group. If you do a drive-by, you're going to show commitment to that group. This was a video. It's not working. Don't ask me why. But it's basically a jumping initiation. Oh, it is working. It is. I got this video from the Los Angeles County Sheriff. Uh, the guy on the floor is the leader of this crew. He's initiating this kid that's been in the neighborhood for a while, and they finally the guys decide, hey, okay, we're gonna we're gonna give him an initiation type of thing. And when the kid walked in, and the guy, you know, is a little kid, he's a big guy, going to beat you up. Started beating him up, and the kid just came and pound him. Literally pound him. I mean, the video goes on for like five more minutes, and all you see is blood coming out from this guy. They basically told this guy, the crew itself, hey, you're done. We're going to demote you, because you can't handle that. But immediately, they proved, the kid proved that he wasn't in fear of his leader. He was showing commitment to that gang. It was actually at the Crips up in Compton, in Los Angeles. How we identify them, and this is what we're doing now. A lot of police, police departments are using this uh, system too. It's a point system that we have. We ask them when they come in or when they do a terrorist stop in this, in the, on, the, on the street or a, a field interview. Are you a gang member? Yes or no? You'll be amazed how many people tell you, yeah, I'm a gang member, because they're proud of what they are. You'd be amazed at one that say, no, I'm not a gang member. Before, they used to say it all the time. Now they don't say it because now they know that if they, they admit that they're a gang member and you arrest them with something, that's going with them to court. And they're going to do a dangerous hearing. They're going to be there with hell without bail for 90 days, automatically. That's one of the, the criteria that we use, self-admission. Information from outside law enforcement agencies. This is where the sharing of information comes very, very important. Uh, be amazed, uh, UMass past incidents that they had in UMass. You know, we, they had no clue what was going on. They gave me a call, I went in there, we started checking, called Boston PD, checked with some names. Both of the incidents, we had gang members uh, in, involved in that incident that happened at UMass in Dartmouth. That's where the sharing of information comes in. Uh, possession of identifiers, you can go from graffiti, paperwork, you name it. Pictures, sometimes we have one or two people identify as a gang member in a picture. That's what we use. We bring that picture to the inmate or to the person we find out in, in a house doing a search, and we ask them, you know this guy? Yep. What's his relation to you? Oh, I hang out with him all the time. OK, are you a gang member? No. Well, guess what? You're a suspected gang member right now. You're showing the colors. You're showing the signs. You're hanging out with these people. Walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's a duck. 
tattoos. That's very important. One of our things that we do is that. As soon as they come in, take your shirt off. Why do you want to take my shirt off? I want to see if you have any tattoos. Why do you want to see my tattoos? I want to see if you have gang tattoos. Okay. Take your shirt off. If they don't, we wait. You don't get processed until you take your shirt off. It's my, my house, my rules. Confidential informants. Most of the big cases that we build, we build them with confidential information. Possession of documents. You'll be amazed. I have plenty of documents in there. Bylaws, what they write. People that are in their gang, their ranks, every structure, you name it. Naming documents. Court paperwork. Court is being good with that now. They come up and they tell you, hey, listen, you know, the ace office gives you a call. What you got on this guy? Nothing. You got something? Yep, I do. It's a suspect member of whatever gang. Okay. Uh, newspapers. We have a reporter here, right? Sorry for what I'm going to say, but it's the truth. A lot of information in the newspapers is half and half, but we still use it. We still use it because if the newspaper writes in there that Joe Schmo is a member of uh, the Crips, well, guess what? I'm going to go by the newspaper, and I'm going to interview this guy as soon as he comes in, or if I see him in the street. Are you a member of a gang? Take your shirt off. I want to see if you have any tattoos. I'm going to start watching them. So we use it as a part of our identifying the members. Association with no members, of course. Hand signs. Guys can have a conversation just doing two or three hand signs, and you go like, what the hell? So you got to be aware of that. I have a few pictures here. Uh, street names or gang names. You know, every kid now from 18 to 28 years old, they have a street name. Joe Blow, J Rock, whatever the heck it is, but they have a street name. And sometimes, you know, if we hear a street name, we don't know who the person is, but guess what? He's walking in the door, or he's getting arrested, and somebody's calling him that. He goes like, wait a minute, did somebody just say J Rock shot somebody two days ago? And you start talking to the person. It's an investigative tool. Territory. How many people we have in one specific territory? I use New Bedford because I deal a lot with New Bedford PD when it comes to the gang stuff. We're driving by, for example, uh, United Front, which is one of the high crime areas, one of the biggest gangs that we have. We drive by there, we see 12 kids hanging in one corner. You stop, you come out of the car, you ask them questions. What are you doing here? You live here, you have no trespass notice, what is it? Tell me. We work from there. Shootings that happen in those territories. Of course, the collars, I'll show you some. All right, early warning signs. This is what we tell our, our officers. Inmate groupings. Again, groupings in the street, same thing, corners. Over here, we have the same guys hanging out in the, in the hallways here all the time, a specific, uh, specific time. Uh, artwork, I have a few, I'll pass it around. These guys are very talented. Assaults, who's getting beat up, who's not getting beat up? What's the tension inside? Assaults on staff, or our correctional officer, or our civilian staff. Confrontations, we see that a lot in our prison when an inmate's trying to uh, join a gang, and that's one of the things that they ask him. Okay, go, go and confront that officer. See how you're going to react, how he's going to react. Uh, request for protective custody, uh, self-mutilation, trying to kill themselves, cut them up. And of course, we monitor the activity in the street, because he always runs down to our prison. If somebody gets killed over there, they're going to try to retaliate inside the prison. Last year, when the big murder in uh, New Bedford, that they retaliated of the mother of a suspected shooter. And we believe that it was a gang incident, uh, the murder of his mother. There was a lot of retaliation inside the prison, a lot of fighting. A lot of threats came in. We spent a lot of money transporting that guy. Some of the type of gangs that we deal with. Street gangs, of course. We deal with a lot of street gangs. Of course, the prison gangs. And then we got with our, what everybody knows, the motorcycle gangs. Motorcycle gangs are picking up in this area again. Last chapter that it was known close by here was the Hells Angels out of Cape Cod. They're no longer in there. They're looking for a house. Rumor has it they're going to be look they're looking for a house in, in this area over here, Westport, New Bedford, Fall River area. May happen. We don't know yet. Closest group that we have over here is the Outlaws up in Taunton. You don't see them a lot. You got the Sidewinders, the Lynchmen. Sidewinders are from here. Fall River, and they're growing. They're growing, growing, growing. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. I was just in a meeting with yesterday with New Bedford PD, 
and we were identifying sign winders. We were like, what the hell is this guy coming from? They're out of, the no out of nowhere, literally out of nowhere. It was a club that it was dead for years, and all of a sudden, and they're hanging between Fall River and New Bedford. That's the area that they're hanging. They have a clubhouse in New Bedford. Hispanic gangs, there's a lot of Hispanic gangs out there. Why? Because there's a lot of Hispanics in here now. White supremacy groups, these are the dangerous ones because they're quiet. And when they decide, they, when they decide that they're going to act up, they're going to act up. They don't care. They're going to do whatever they have to do. Once in a while, you see them painting swastikas and stuff in houses and things like that, just to let the people know, hey, we're still around. Female gangs, it's a big trend now. We have a gang in New Bedford, it's just females. People go like, nah, nah, nah no, wait, <laughs> yeah. Although the leader of that gang doesn't look like a female, but she's a female. Very powerful female, too. Extremists are religious groups. People talk about Al-Qaeda. Well, guess what? We have our own extremists and religious groups here in the United States, too. They're crazy. It's about what they want. OK? You know, people may say, well, what are you talking about? You guys know PETA? Animal people? Love our animals, don't kill the doggies and all that stuff, and don't kill the fish, don't eat the fish. Well, guess what? They're part of the terrorist group. We have them as a terrorist group because they have done crazy stuff. ELF, which is the Earth, Earth Liberation Front, they burned houses in, in uh, Attleboro because they were building houses over there and there was a lot of wood being used, so they burned houses. They're considered a terrorist group, an extremist group. Major groups in the United States. Of course, we got the Crips and the Bloods. Back in the 80s, these two groups make a lot of, a lot of news in the, in the paper. Yeah, there was a big war between the Crips and the Bloods in California. Well, guess what? We have Crips and Bloods over here, OK? Specifically here in Fall River. And then you got the Black Gangster Disciples and the Latin Kings. Latin Kings making a lot of news in this area, too. Of course, you got the Nietas from Puerto Rico, which was a specifically a prison gang. And then you got the MS-13, the Mara Salvatrucha, Salvadorian gang. It's one of the most dangerous gangs right now because they're rising. Their numbers are rising. They're ruthless. They don't care. They grab a machete, and they cut your head off, or they cut your arm off. They don't care. They really don't care. Because what you're going to do to them? You're going to put me in jail, and you're going to deport me? Go ahead. I'll come back for another name. And that's exactly what they do. And then you got 18th Street, which is the second, the second biggest Latino gang after MS-13. And these two are rivals. They have what they call an SOS. It's a shoot on sight order. One of them sees one of them, they try to kill them. One of them sees one of them, they try to kill them. So when they come to our prison, we have to identify these guys. We get a lot of detainees in, in our facility. And one of the things that our officers do when they get Salvadorians or Mexicans, they immediately ask them, are you MS-13 or you're 18th Street? Let me see your tattoos. Because if we put them in one unit together, they're going to try to kill each other. Thank God we haven't had that yet. And we have put a few of them together. And we talk to them. Don't go kill somebody. Don't do nothing stupid. If you're going to do something stupid, let me know. We'll move you. And then you got the Folk Nation and the People Nation. Just to give you a little history about this too. All these gangs belong to either or this nation. And what they did, because the Crips and the Bloods were so powerful, People in Chicago decided to create their own major gang, their own big gang. And they basically started like an industry. They'll figure, well, we're going we're gonna to sell franchises. We're going to call our place a nation, like the Nation of Islam or all these other groups. We're going to call ourselves a nation. And the black gangster disciples decided to call their nation Folk Nation. And if you're a member of the Folk Nation, you're going to use some specific identifiers. And I'm going to show you the specific identifiers that, they're gonna, that they have. But if you are, let's say you are uh, Monty Spark, you're a folk nation, you run with your street name, but you run under our nation. And what that does is that it gives you support. It gives you contacts for drugs. It gives you contacts for shooters. It gives you contacts for everything. But you also have to pay dues to that group. And they bless you. Same thing with the people nation. People Nation started by the Latin Kings and the Vice Lords up in Chicago. Why did they do that? Because the Black Gangs Disciples formed the Folk Nation and law, it got bigger than their gangs. So they figure again, strength by number, we join together. 
they may have their own personal, excuse me, their own personal codes, but they all have the same identifiers. And I'll show you. Example, the Crips and the Bloods. We'll start with the Crips. Started in 1968 in Los Angeles, predominantly African Americans. Uh, in this area, we have a lot of Asians. In California has a lot of Asians now that are part of, uh, of the Crips. Blue identifiers, so basically they wear everything blue. Uh, one of the, the trends that they have back in the 80s, they have the British nice sneakers or, or clothes, and they used to wear all that stuff. And they will ask them, why are you wearing that? The BK stands for blood killer. So if you were part of that crew, you hate the blood, you have to wear stuff like that. They did not have a central leadership until they became members of the Folk Nation. And fighting amongst the Crips is very common. In New Bedford, we have two set of Crips, and they fight between each other all the time. So to solve that problem, some of them join the Folk Nation. So the guys that are not members of the Folk Nation, but are what they call renegade Crips, now they can attack them at any time. And again, this changes. This just changed last year. It wasn't like that before. Everybody just hated each other. Uh, the Bloods. The Bloods are also called Damu, D-A-M-U, which is Swahili, African word for blood. Again, the African Americans and Asians. Most of this area, they're Asians. Red identifiers. Again, the CK, Calvin Klein. Well, guess what? Crypto. Okay? They used to see kids in school with Calvin Klein jeans. Crips will come and beat the crap out of them. Why are you wearing a Crip killer pants? Then we have the East Coast and West Coast Bloods. The East Coast Blood, they're called the UBN, United Blood Nation. They're affiliated with the Bloods on the West Coast. They call themselves cousins, but they don't like to hang out with them too much. And again, they're all united against the Crips. That's their main enemy. The Crips, Folk Nation, that's their main enemy for the Bloods. This picture I got over here, I got it from California. And it's funny, I always point it out. I got it from the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. The pit bull is a big gang, gang banger. You know, they blocked out his face. So they figure, you know, we're gonna identify the pit bull. But if you notice, it's a female, right? And she's wearing the typical red do-rag representing the bloods. Right here in the corner is a satellite TV. Well, they figured out, she says, she's, I think from like when I got the picture, she was like 18, 19 years old. Uh, they did a little background on her. They found this picture on, on a rate that they did on one of the leaders of the Bloods in California. And they figured out her father was a surgeon, you know, father had money, you know, all this good stuff, but she was just the girlfriend of one of the guys. And she was a full member of the Bloods in a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy neighborhood in California. So don't say, you know, that's why you gotta pay attention to your kids. You don't know what they're doing. They had a lot of stuff from us. Then we go to the gangster disciples, excuse me. Starting in the 1960s in Chicago, Illinois, predominantly African Americans. Now we have all kinds of gangster disciples. You have Latin disciples, you name it. Disciples everywhere. The identifiers are gray, black, blue, and white. This is what is the difference between all these other groups. They use a six-pointer star, or the pitchforks, or the heart with the wings, and they do have a centralized leadership. Now pay attention to this. What I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what, it, what it comes, the, the difference, this is the, the tagging and the graffiti that you see. Each part of these tattoo means something, okay? The pitchfork, three-pronged pitchfork, represents the folk nation, okay? And represents the, th the strength that the nation has, that the folk nation have, the power that they have. The heart, and sometimes you see the GDs for the Gangs of the Disciples, sometimes you see ILD and St. Latin Disciples. Whatever crew they're representing, they'll put it inside the heart. The heart represents the love that they have for the folk nation. Inside the heart, you're going to see the initials of their crew. And then if you notice over here, what they call the wings, each side has three, a total of six. they always going to use their number six, which is their identifiers. They may draw a crown. The crown will have six points, representing folk nation or gangster disciples or the disciple nation, as they call it. So everything has a meaning. You're always going to find the tails. And you're always going to find the horns when they draw the heart. Any questions so far? No? Keep going. 
Uh, then yet, as they started in Puerto Rico in 1971, they were a specific prison gang. Until this day, they are a specific prison gang. They actually consider themselves a political party in Puerto Rico, although nobody votes for them, and they're not registered as a political party. But they do have a lot of political influence. They have 12 attorneys uh, that represent them in Puerto Rico, very powerful, and two in the United States. Uh, they make a lot of money inside the prison. They basically control the prison. They tell the governor and they tell the uh, commissioner of corrections in Puerto Rico what to do, and how to run their jail. They can snap their fingers and they'll create a riot in any second. Identifiers are the blue, red, and black. They have a strict chain of command. And you gotta follow the chain of command. If you don't follow the chain of command, you'll break the, the, the commandments and you can get penalties. Penalties could be from picking up the trash to murder. It all depends. And again, they don't consider themselves a gang. They consider themselves an association. In the United States, we have two versions. We have the prison version of the Nietas, and we have the street version of the Nietas. Uh, the street version of the Nietas came after a lot of immigrants came to the United States from Puerto Rico, and they started getting incarcerated. They started opening chapters of the Nietas inside the prison. Of course, they started recruiting young kids instead of recruiting old kids. So what happened is the young kids came with the mentality, well, I belong to a gang. As soon as they came out, they started opening their own chapters in their neighborhood of the Nietas. That's why the Nieta chapters in the street in the United States are not considered nietas, what they call true nietas in Puerto Rico, or in the prison system. They have to adapt themselves to that chapter. But we do have them in the street, and the strongest chapter of nieta right now in the street is in New Bedford. Very quiet, they're, they're business people. They don't mess around with other gangs unless they come and mess around with them. And other gangs don't mess with them because they know they're, bu they, they're business. They, they will kill anybody in a second. They don't care. Don't come to their territory, they don't go to yours. Latin Kings, everybody talk about the Latin Kings. Signed in the 1940s in Chicago, three guys decided to start this group. Specifically at one point of Puerto Ricans, not anymore. They had Latin Kings from all crews. Uh, the colors are black, yellow, or gold. One of their saying is black and gold never goes old. They use the five-pointed crown. Gangster Disciples use six points, these guys use five points. Uh, they use three letters, ADR, Amor del Rey, which means love of king, okay? They're also using a new thing now, so the cops don't know what's going on. But of course, a lot of cops are smarter than these guys. They're using 423. When they're writing words now, they're writing letters, or so they're writing graffiti, they write 423. 423 means the same thing, ADR, Amor del Rey. It's four letters on the first word, two letters on the second word, three letters on the third word. That's one of the main taggings now. So we don't identify them. That's how they text message. Go on a computer, you go to MySpace, you type 423, you're gonna see all kinds of stuff of Latin Kings. They have a written constitution. They don't consider themselves a gang. Again, they consider themselves an organization. Puerto Rican parade was two weeks ago in New York. Over a million Puerto Ricans were over there. From those millions of Puerto Ricans, there were 132 Latin Kings from New York chapter that they always march in the parade. This year, the FBI, the gang task force of New York, uh, NYPD decided they were not going to go on the parade because now they're labeled as a terrorist group, local terrorist group, local gang, local criminal enterprise. So they were not going to allow them to show their colors in there, on the parade, like they used to do every year. When they decided to go on the parade, cops stepped in and said, no, you guys ain't doing this. You guys are not going to ruin the show for anybody. Because what happened was every time that they did that, the bloods will come out, the local bloods in New York, although they're cousins, but they don't get along, they will come and fight the Latin Kings, and they always would have something going on. Well, the Latin Kings decided to tell the police, screw you, and the 120 something guys over there, they all got arrested. And if somebody came out and they were wearing a collar, black and gold, you're under arrest. They released them the next day, of course, but they arrested them, all of them. They didn't have but even one incident that day in New York the Puerto Rican Day Parade, which every year before that they had incidents. So they're getting stronger against this guy. And again, they're very, very powerful. If you see this tattoo, it says A-L-K-Q-N, which means Almighty Latin King Queen Nation. This is the only gang, other than female gangs, that the females have power. A female Latin queen 
with the rank of what we call first crown, has the same structure, same power of a male from another chapter that has the same rank, that is a first crown. Not because she's a female, it means that she has no power. They have equal rights. The only gang that have equal rights for the female. A matter of fact, in Massachusetts right now, the main counsel for the state of Massachusetts is one female. And she holds the rank of enforcer. The enforcer is the one that order hits and all this crazy stuff. She's very, very crazy. Very crazy. And if you see her, you'll run the other way. Because she's very crazy. And she's, she's a female, she looks like a girl, but she's scary. And we go to my friends for MS-13, or La Mara Salvatrucha. Started in the 1980s in El Salvador. They're a Hispanic group. Uh, most of their tattoos, you, and this one thing about these guys, they will always be tattooed. They don't care. They tattoo themselves. They're proud of who they are. They use the MS-13, of course, for Mara Salvatrucha. Salvadorian pride. Colors that they use are blue, gray, and white. They like to use like Dallas Cowboys colors and Dallas Cowboys shirts and hats represent the their crew. They have plenty of access to drugs and weapons, have a high level of violence, and they have a possible terrorist link. The only reason that the immigration enforcement officers, or ICE as is known, and FBI, and Park Police, and all these federal agencies are interested in MS-13 is, one, because they have no papers, so you have no control of who they are. They can come in at any, any time. Two, they infiltrated three agents in uh, California into their gang, and as soon as they found out, they shot them up in little pieces, so the federal government took it personal. And three, because they control the border, the United States and Mexico. As you know, anybody can cross the border these days. There was a rumor at one point that one of the leaders of uh, MS-13 in uh, Honduras met with one of Al-Qaeda's members that was supposed to come for the September 11 uh, terrorist attack. And he was denied access to the United States, so he flew to Mexico and he tried to cross the border. He tried to go, do it through MS-13. MS-13, when they found out what he was going to do, because he wasn't saying, they said, no, you ain't going anywhere. Then I guess the guy offered them like $2 million or something like that, and they changed their mind. But then they figured out, well, you know, because a terrorist attack happened. It was all crazy stuff. So the Fed started getting involved in it, and nothing happened after that, but they're still watching them because of that. And the, they started, they basically, the, the members of MS-13 were all uh, members of the militia in El Salvador. And they migrated to the United States. They started hanging out. They started making, again, illegals, strength by numbers. Started hanging with all the Salvadorians in, in California. And they developed this gang, very powerful. They were so powerful that the biggest gang in California, the Mexican Mafia, was afraid of them. The Mexican Mafia controls specific drug places in, in the street. And MS-13 had their own places too. So when the Mexican Mafia came to them and asked them for money, because they have to pay rent, they told them, bye, see you later, I ain't paying you. The Mexican Mafia said, well, come on, what do you mean you're going to pay me? I'm the Mexican Mafia. So I'm MS-13. I ain't paying you a penny. So once they say that, the guys that were, went to charge them money from the Mexican Mafia, or La M, like it's called, they tried to attack them. The guys from MS-13 came, they brought the machetes out, and they killed them. And he started a war between them. Then they started taking posts from the Mexican Mafia. They started collecting money. That's the fight with the 18th Street Gang. Because the 18th Street Gang used to collect money for the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia decided to make a truce. They decided, well, we go with the strongest from these two groups, which was MS-13. Now they're allied with the, with the Mexican Mafia, which is the biggest drug cartel group from Mexico in the United States. So they're very, very dangerous. Access to weapons, you name it, they have it. Let's see. They got chapters throughout the United States. I think in every state right now, they must have a chapter. If not, they're working on it. Enemies throughout with the 18th Street and La Sombra Negra, which is a black shadow. A black shadow is a dead squad. It's a hit squad that they have in El Salvador. In El Salvador, the way that they deal with these guys is like this. They walked in, they come off the plane, they do two things. They ask them, where are you going? Go to my house. Make sure you don't hang out in the street. You seen in the street, they're going to kill you. Or you're going to jail. If they leave the United States when they get to that airport with any criminal charges, they put them in prison in El Salvador. El Salvador, they have four correctional facilities that are technically MS-13. 
You walk in there and all you see is MS-13. They don't have correctional officers. It's run by them because they're there for life. They stay in that prison for the rest of their life. They're not coming out. And they run, the pri they run their gang from that prison. They have cell phones. You name it, they have it in there. They control the MS-13 in California and the United States. They control it from those prisons in El Salvador. And what happens is that every time that you do a raid and you pick them up, you take 50, 100, maybe 200 outside of the United States, but there's already 300 lined up to take the places. So it's very, very, very scary group. They fear deportation. That's one of the only ways to flip them and get information out of them. And he's had work and a few times. I was involved in a case that so we did that. And uh, we got a lot of information of the guy. And the guy didn't go back to El Salvador. And uh, the federal government did a lot of arrests on MS-13 because of his information. That's a tool that we use to try to get information from them. Then, of course, we got 18th Street, the rival gangs. Started in the 1960s in Los Angeles, again, Hispanics. That's the different versions that they write 18, okay? Again, they, they have sets all over the United States, known for law enforcement murders, the ruthless, and the association with the Mexican and Colombian drug cartels. The only difference that they have from, from them and MS-13 is that they don't control the, the border. But when it comes to drugs, they're the number, the number two. Bristol County is our local people. Start with Attleboro. Attleboro has a massive group of Crips. They call themselves the Asian Boys, which we have in Fall River. Identifies of the color blue, of course, and their rival with the Bloods, which are the Oriental Boys. Association with groups in Lynn, Revere, Lowell, Fall River, and Providence. The Bloods, again, the Oriental Boys, rival with the Crips. Same thing, colors red, of course. The 504 Boys, that's out of here, Fall River. They changed their name now. Now they're mafioso. Then they changed their name again to the Last Warriors. They've been changing their names. I think last week they changed their name again. Most of the guys that are members of this group are in prison right now. They're mostly black males. They came from Boston to this area and they started their chapter. Colors are black, gray, and blue. They affiliate themselves with the gangster, gangster disciples in the Folk Nation. Uh, again, they, they call the 504 Street because of their location. They're between 5th and 4th Street. So that's why they came up with the name. And of course, they have uh, Heritage Heights as part of their other uh, areas that they control. The allies with the MS, uh, Mafioso and uh, Root Street in New Bedford. Root Street in New Bedford doesn't exist anymore. There's only a few guys left. But at one point, when Root Street in New Bedford was very, very active, they were affiliated with them. They did have contacts in Boston and Providence. Uh, Mafioso, one of the most known gangs in this area, in Full River. Codes are brown, black, and white. Allies with the 504 and the Crips. Uh, enemies with the Bloods and the Latin Kings, of course, they hate each other. They have a written constitution, and they, most of them, they run the west side of Fall River. They have franchised to New Bedford. There's only a few of them in New Bedford, but we've seen them in New Bedford. In New Bedford, we got the Monty Spark people. That's uh, one of the tattoos that they have, the MP. And you see the M has a tail that's showing the affiliation with the Folk Nation. One of the symbols of the Folk Nation is the heart with the tail, like I showed you earlier. That's why he has that on the, the little shield that he has in his arm. Colors are blue and gray. Again, they're affiliated with the Fog Nation. They run basically South Central New Bedford. Enemies with the West Side, which is United Front, and uh, what used to be Root Street. They call themselves South Side. And most of the tattoos, will see, will, you will see the MP for Montes Park or the SS for South Side. South First Street, they were the first Latin Disciple Folk Nation group in this area. Well, they changed their names now. Now they call themselves South First Crips. They don't want to hang out with the Folk Nation anymore. They call themselves Crips now, and they're very young now, not like it used to be. Colors are white, blue, and gray. They basically run the Ben Rose Housing Complex, and they're allies with Monty Spark. Same enemies of Monty Spark, the same enemies that they have. The Latin Kings, United Front. Very violent, young kids, but they're very, 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 very violent. So United Front is a group of females that are from United Front. If you see them, you can't see it too much, but what they're doing, they're doing what they call the heart with the wings that I showed you earlier. They're showing the affiliation with the gangster disciples, with the folk nation. Colors are red, white, and gray. They changed their name, I think, to Black Mafia now. 
but they still use UFD. Enemies with Monty Spark, uh, they basically run the West Lone projects, and most of their members, uh, members are what we call Code 4 in the city of New Bedford, which means uh, they carry a weapon, a concealed weapon. Very dangerous. Half of these guys are in prison right now. Again, the Nietas, looking at the presidential hide projects, uh, enemies with the Latin Kings, and most of the stuff is drug dealing. That's all they care about. Calls are red and black. Latin Kings, uh, allies with the Root Street at one point. Again, Root Street doesn't exist anymore. They're located in the North Front Street, Belleville Ave, Biddle Street, Potty Street, Breckenwood Projects, they control that area. They got a hit, pretty, pretty big hit in the last, uh, last month in New Bedford, but they're still active, they're still very active. Enemies with the South First Street, and they have ties with uh, Fall River, Latin Kings. Motorcycle gangs, again, Fall River, we have Sidewinders, a few groups here and there, but well, most of the motorcycle groups that we have, they're, they're, they're basically back in town and Easton. You got the Outlaws, you see the Massachusetts chapter, and you got the Pagans, they're associated with the Outlaws, and of course you got the Hells Angels, and all them groups. All right, little class of graffiti over here. This was taken back in 2004. In this corner in New Bedford, that's uh, across from Gome School, South, uh, South Second Street, and South Street. There was a murder that happened in there, in that corner. And members of uh, what they call the South Side came in and decided, well, we're going to tag our place. It's the first time that we see a tagging like this. And it shows you all the groups that are associated in what they call the South Side which is Monty Sparks of 1st Street, Scott Street, and Woodlawn Street, down in the south end of New Bedford. For us, it was very important to take pictures of the graffiti because they're basically telling you who they are. They kept it concealed for years, who were members, what crews were part of the south side, what they call south side, and now when they're displaying it, it's basically a slap for law enforcement telling you, hey, we don't care anymore, this is what we're doing. This is up in New Bedford again, so 1st Street. Again, you see the pitchfork over here. By the way, this dumpster is still over there. This was back in 2003 they took this picture. Uh, BOSS, which means Brothers of the Strong Struggle or Brothers and Sisters of the Struggle. That's their political movement for the gangster disciples. That's what you have here. It says Disciple, Love, Be Love. Again, the same thing over here, Brothers of the Strong Struggle. And the pitchfork again with the three points and the tea prongs. That was back in the day, Root Street, the Root Street uh, tagging. They only always wrote their names for whatever reason. This is, uh, again, in New Bedford, MacArthur Drive, right next to the Knuckleheads Club. It's 18th Street tagging. Uh, the three dots that you see on the 18th Street, by the way, this is used by MS-13 also, it's called My Crazy Life. And what they mean by My Crazy Life, or Mi Vida Loca, is where the gang will take you. They either will take you to prison, They'll take you to jail, or you'll die. I mean, to prison, prison, hospital, and death. Those are the three points of my crazy life. That's their MO. That's what they live by. Their code. And again, you have the two versions of 18, regular 18, and the combination of Roman numbers. This was on uh, South First Street. Again, this is some guy that started going nutty. 18th Street, we identify the guy as a Mexican guy. He wrote his street name. And again, he wrote 18th Street again on the corner over here. This is in Fall River. This is a Crip territory, an MS-13 territory. Again, six-pointer start at the start of David, which is used by the Folk Nation and the Crip members. Semi-pitchfork over here. Can't go clearer than that. Crip, right there. Six-pointer star. 360 in blue. That's the knowledge that they have. It's a full circle, 360 degrees of knowledge. It's part of their bylaws. Again, you see the crip letter again in blue, represent their color, and then you get the six point of start of David. It's a total mess, and I'll explain this one in a second. Six point of start, you get a start of David. See the gangster name, crips again in their graffiti. And over here, you have the five, and see it's crossed over like that. And number three, but the five is upside down, right? Why is the five upside down? Anybody knows? What was that? Close, but no cigar. It's disrespecting the last It's disrespecting the people nation, correct. 
Every time that you see a number like that, let's say if you have a five-pointed star, right, or a five-pointed crown, and they cross through over, or they mark a big X on top of it, that's disrespect. If you have a B, for example, you see a graffiti of just a B, and the B's, the, the, the circles inside the B are crossed over, same, same thing, they're disrespecting the blood. That's what they're doing. That's how they show disrespect. Either the sign is upside down, or it's crossed over, okay? But you see the three-pointed crown over here? It's representing the, in the three, you see the three is always up. And BK, blood killer, blood killer, sorry. Six-pointer star again. I think he tried to write 508, something like that. Over here, slob, that's what he says. Slob, and it's backwards, it's more disrespectful. Slob is disres the disrespect name that they have for the bloods. That's what the Crips call the bloods, slobs. What he wrote was a slob killer. See the K at the end? And again, he closed out with the 360, which is also a mafioso, uh, uh, mafioso uh, identifier. There's some MS-13 guys. These guys were uh, picked up two years ago on an operation that was done in Boston that was part of that. Uh, it's the MS-13, it says Salvatrucha in the back. They're very proud of what they, what the, who they are. Uh, EBLS, mean East Boston local Salvatrucha. You see it says Salvadorian pride on the side. The spider, that was his nickname, so he decided to tattoo it in his chest, on his chest right in the middle, and the MS-13. A lot of people ask, well, why that sign? Everybody does this, right? Sign language is uh, love, you know what I'm saying? Sign of love. Well, I just came from a training a few months ago, actually last month before I went on vacation, and I, we spoke with an ex expert from uh, MS-13, and he gave us a, a better class than we all knew what, what it was all about. And back in the 80s, if you were a headbanger, that's what you did all the time. Because Ronnie James Dio, that was his, his, his sign. Every time he heard heavy metal, you were a headbanger, and that's all he used to do. Well, a lot of these guys, MS 13s, they were headbangers. And the original leaders, that's how they used to say hello to each other. What's up? They used to wear hair, long hair, I mean, all this stuff, and they used to say hi like each other like that. So they adapted the Ronnie James Dio sign, or the heavy metal sign, or the devil horns, whatever you want to call it, to their culture of uh, MS 13. That's where it came from. A lot of people used to say, well, if you put it upside down, it looks like an M. Well, no. That's what I thought, but no. Uh, local guys, Gangster Disciple tattoos. Again, six pointer stars, a different variation. The pitchforks are pointed up. GD is a Gangster Disciple, that's a ripper. A grave ripper. All right. A few solutions that we give to tell everybody, and I'll open it for, uh, for questions. I think I had a video, but if I could figure this out, I'll show you a video real quick. That's why I tell everybody, a gang problem is not a police problem. It's a community problem, okay? Get involved. If you see something, report it. Let a police department know that a gang unit know. We love taking pictures of stuff like this. Looks good in our presentations. Notify the police, of course. Report the graffiti locations. Uh, our department, if it's in any place, you know, we can get a permit. We, we have a unit that that's what we do. We go, we send the guys over there with two inmates, and they take all the graffiti down. We like to take pictures. We have, try to identify what's going on. Uh, you know, works for the community. Works both ways. You got the inmates that probably did that graffiti. He's taking it down himself. He may come back six months later, paint it all over again, but at one point he took it out. So it works both ways. Volunteer your time, of course. It's for name and number. Any questions? So far, no questions. Sure? Yes, no, maybe. All right. Let's see, one question that I always get, what's up with gangster rap? What's up with all these rappers? Well, I want to show you something about the rappers. The young people in the room, you guys know who the game is? The game, it's a rapper, right? You guys think he's a gang member or not? Huh?
the hip hop while being a gangster. Gangster revolved out of the, out of the early and mid 90s. The two pops just were now. There's not necessarily a gang thing you thought that you to be one. We'll show you different. Eighty percent, and he's sad. I mean, he's sad. Don't get me wrong. I like rap. Eighty percent, eighty, eighty percent of rap artists are involved in a gang or were involved in a gang. Uh, one perfect example is uh, Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg, his last CD was. Uh, blue pride or the color blue, something like that. He's showing you exactly what he's from. You guys remember uh, Tone Locke, Funky Cole Medina? His name was Tone LOC. LOC stands for Love of Crips. Now you have a lot of these rappers that they use their name and they have LOC at the end. That's what it's called, Love of Crips. A lot of people go like, huh? Well, that's what it is. I'll show you right now a few of the things that I have here. Let's see, which one is it? All right, Let's see if I can get this real quick. to show you some things. Hand signs. A lot of people ask me, oh, I want to see hand signs. Well, here you go. Here you go, hand signs. This is a member of the folk nation. Crap. If you look at his hands, what is he doing? That's right. He's doing a six-pointed star, which is amazing. I've tried to do that like six times, and I can't do it. And I have tried. Believe me. I, I have tried, and for some reason, I, I can. I'm not smart enough, I guess. All right. This one was picked up by officers in Los Angeles. What is that? That's correct. That's a vest. It's a bulletproof vest. But they added some stuff to their, to their little, you know, putting their own thing. Put a little red bandanas. Of course, it was a member of blood. See a little hoodlum right there and all that stuff. What's that? What? What's that? Blood. That's right. Look at it, it says blood. Don't know how to do it, but that's what it says. B-L-O-O-D, blood. <laughs> that's what it says, blood. Okay? And again, you may, they do it so fast. I used to do that when I can't do it anymore. I'm getting old. But they do it so fast that you may see kids walking in the hallway over here and they're gonna do this. Put their hands down. And you're like, did he just do something? Yeah, what the hell happened in there? Well, they're doing something like that. Latin Kings, for example. They, all, they love... Another thing that I forgot to tell you, this is very important. Members of the Folk Nation, the Crips, all those groups, Black Gangs, Disciples, they use everything to the right. For example, you have a kid walking in the hallway. And he's walking with a blue bandana on his right pocket. He's showing affiliation for the Crips or the Folk Nation, any member of that group. Same thing with the Latin Kings or the Bloods, people in the Folk Nation. They use everything to the left. The Latin Kings use this sign, a sign for love in sign language. When they say hi to each other, they pull up their left hand, hit themselves three times in the chest, sorry for the mic, and they say, Amor de Rey, or love of King. They walk like that. Or they just salute each other, they put their hands together, if you look at this, what's that? Huh? It's a crown. It's a five-point crown. And they go, love of kings. Or they just touch each other in the chest. I know a lot about Latin kings. <laughs> Sad. Let's see. There's another good one. It's a Latin king uh, graffiti. Almighty Latin king nation. They forgot the queens over there. ADR, Amor de Rey. So ADR to my family, to my brothers. 135, I think it was the area code where they took this picture. I forgot where it was from. Uh, Camden, New Jersey. Sorry about that. Five dots representing the affiliation, the Latin Kings, the five uh, points. 
The B is not for Boston. It's affiliation with the Bloods. Piru, which is another name for blood. That was the original street in California where the Bloods were formed. It was Piru Street. And again, CK for Crip Killer. And if you see the C, even though they're disrespecting it, they're still crossing it over for disrespect. And of course, the five-pointed crown. The queen for the queen. Another one. This is blood members. They brand themselves like that. MS-13 people do the same thing. But if you see an a, a, a African-American male with those dots on the right arm, they call them the blood paw. If you look at a poppy, his paw is just like that. Little circle in the middle and two little circles on the top. So they call it a paw. Some of them have four or five paws. That's depending on the rank that they have. They don't use stars, although they're generals. They use the little paws. This was, uh, again, Camden, New Jersey. Blood member was killed, and all their brothers came in, and they put the little rags in there. If you see, it's still fresh, uh, fresh crime scene. See the crime scene tape right there? The guy that gave me this picture, it was a detective, gang unit detective that dealt with that case. He said that he went in, they closed down the crime scene, they left. They came back 20 minutes later because they knew somebody was going to show up to the crime scene. And in 20 minutes, they had that done. So, guys are smart. It's one thing, if you're dealing with, an, with one gang member, so law enforcement guys here, always remember that. If you know that guy is a gang member and you're dealing with him by yourself, keep your eyes open because there's going to be somebody else watching him somewhere around the area. The only reason that they do that is that they want to know what they're telling you. Okay. Because if the guy that you're, that you're talking, that you're doing the field, uh, interview, says something to you, they want to know. A lot of these guys don't talk to the police without a person present. When I do my interviews inside the prison with these individuals, they ask me, can I have another one of my guys present with me so I can be a witness and he doesn't say that I'm snitching? But no. It's my house. It's my rules. You want a witness? I get one of my officers here. But you always got to keep your eyes open. If I walk in the unit, I have a unit that 80% of them are gang members. I work with three people, and we're all watching each other's back. Because when they see me going into one of the units, they know I'm interviewing a gang member. And they, they want to know what's going on. So you play the game. Let's see. It's a uh, blood memorial. Again, you see the guy hanging the rope over here, the red sweatshirt, and the guns, of course. OK? Let's see. Sign for blood, of course. Uh, this was in Yonkers, New York. Same thing, Crip Killer, Five Point Star, the blood, all the good stuff. See, they even put some color in the little Five Point Star. Made it red, nice and cute. Again, same thing, Crip Killer. What's that? CK, that's right. Crip killer. Crip killer. So he's a what? He's a blood, right? Uh, this was uh, Camden, New Jersey again. New Jersey, they have a big problem with this. If you notice here, see his dual rag is on his left side. He has a shotgun in his hand, in his hand right? What do you think he's going to go do? He's hunting for bloods. Because the Crips, remember, they always wear everything to the right. When they're going to do something, when they're going to shoot somebody, when they're going to attack somebody, they wear their rag on the other side of the leg to show that they're mean business. They're going to war. They're going to do something. All right. This is a wacko guy from New Jersey again who was taken into prison. He's his Crips and he has his whole tattoo thing here and he's doing the Crips sign and the blood killer sign over here. They're amazing. Again, Bloods again, 311, that's in New Jersey also. That's their area code. Another uh, Crip killer over there. Doo -doo -doo -doo. MOB. Anybody seen that before? What's the meaning of that? What does it mean? Nobody? Anybody? 
There's two meanings for this word. Okay? In the street language, a lot of gang members use the MOB. A lot of blood members use the MOB. When you used to interview them, that's the only tattoo that they have. And you would ask them, and they tell you it's money over bitches. You have a lot of members that are Crips that have MOB. I believe that. The original meaning for the MOB is member of blood. Very simple. Member of blood. And usually they're going to have it just like that. It's a little five-pointer side with red dripping out of it. Okay? Well, that's what it is, member of blood. So if you see somebody, and this, believe me, there's a lot of people that have tattoos that say MOB. Hey, what's that all about? Uh, money over bitches. No. Okay? You're aware. And here's my friend, the game. Now this is what the game is doing in this picture. This, this was from, uh, what the heck was that magazine? One of those uh, Money Murders magazine, which is like a hip-hop magazine type of thing. And the blood over here is showing his tattoos. And the signs that he's doing, the hand sign, it's hard to see, but you know, he's doing the blood sign, what you saw earlier. And he's covering red. He's wearing red all over the place. When this picture came out, his agent asked him, what the heck are you doing? Are you crazy? Because, as you know, law enforcement fell on the guy immediately. Yo, you're a member of blood. No, 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 no. He lost a lot of contracts and stuff like that. I believe he was coming to Providence. Yes, it was him. He, he was going to Providence for a concert in the uh, Dunkin' Donuts Center, and they canceled the concert because they knew it was gonna have, they were going to have a problem. They were going to have a problem with the, the Crips and the Bloods, and it was going to be a bloodbath, and he, there were letters of informants coming out saying the same thing, that they were going to reunite in there, and they were going to kill each other. So, and again, the same, same pictures over here. Any questions? No? Chief, if there's no more questions, we all set. Let me just show you some, one more thing. What I was telling you about the bylaws that we have. And then we'll go. And again, this is local. Local stuff. Should open up. There you go. All right, this, this is from the, what they call, what we call it mafiosos. And it's basically the bylaws of what they have, what the, the rules that they have to follow, the definition of everything. You see it says mafia members all face illegal acts. Uh, that's the codes and the commandments that they have to follow, the points of everything you know, that, that, that they follow, uh, the colors, the meaning, brown is unbreakable, black is dominant, and white, peace. Those are the colors that they use, brown, black, and, uh, and white. Uh, again, you see the goals that they have. Uh, let's see what else they have in here. Uh, I mean, the ranks. This is, this is how structured these guys are. And they say, well, they're not that structured. Well, yes, they are. These are the, gang, the ranks that they have. A gangster is a brother under 18 years old. A mobster is a brother on probation. A soldier, it should be soldier, but they write soldiers. Uh, May brothers earning stripes. They get lieutenants. These are black uh, uh, managers or the block managers, the guys that run the drug uh, corners. Uh, the dons, which are the crew captains, and the don chief, uh, they have the 13 bosses. That's, why the, that's what the main council is formed by, 13 uh, mafia bosses, like they call it. And they got to know who they are. And then you keep going, you start seeing all the little bylaws in here. And that's the, that's the law number 7.10. And you keep going, definition of family, and then again, the different variations. Sometimes they write letters, or they write graffiti, and they write that, 333. Three, three. That's the meaning, money, murder, mur uh, whereas a 312, love, life, and loyalty. So they're very, very smart when we think they're not. Let's see, the creed for the nuns. And the good thing about this, oh, these are the codes, which is for law enforcement is excellent, because now we know all the codes when they write. So they have to change it once in a while. But the good thing about this is that what they do is that they give this to the, to the person that's going to get initiated. And they go, OK, you know, all the bylaws, memorize them. And once you memorize them, you have, I think they have 13 days. You have 13 days to memorize them, and you come back. And you tell me everything that is on the bylaws. And they have to 
tell them exactly what they have in the paperwork. The reason that they do this, one, commitment, two, they're ordering you also to recruit other people. If you go to another place, hey, you want to become a member of Mafioso? So they have to write everything so the person can learn it. They're supposed to destroy this paperwork after they learn their bylaws. 80% of them, they don't do that. Let's see. Again, those are the codes. Again, this is how they talk each other. MAF, Mobster Ally Forever, Forever About Money. These guys are crazy. Let's see. This one here that, uh, I believe this one has the names. The commandments. I have 13 commandments, not 10. Again, they finish always with a three pointed crown. Now, this is the tattoo that they should have if they're a member of Mafioso or something related to this type of uh, tattoo in the crown, west side. If you see that, WS, that's what they run. That's Mafioso in their lingo, in their. That's the alphabet, the uh, Folk Nation alphabet. Okay. Again, these are variations of tattoos that they can have. Yes, sir. Do they want to have an education? Do they go to colleges? Well, that's that's the new trend that we're seeing with a lot of the gang members. They are they're telling them to uh, go to school. That's number one. They're telling them, don't have a record. If they think, you know, they, again, they're getting smart, they're developing like everything. A lot of, the, especially in California, right, we're seeing that a lot. If they know that a gang member has the potential of being somebody that he likes to school, although he hangs out with them and he likes the school, they encourage them to go to school. Or to go to the military, or go to work to a law enforcement agency, okay? Again, they're doing all kind of surveillance on police, for example. They may have uh, Chicago a few years ago. They, they, uh, their task force, the Feral Gang Task Force in Chicago, they were doing a raid on Latin Kings. A big raid on Latin Kings. And it was drug related and you know, crimes and stuff like that. And they bring their uh, narcotics unit from the Chicago PD, local PD, and there were seven Puerto Ricans in that department. Chicago is full of Puerto Ricans, just like New York. And, and, and you know, they, came out with a briefing, they're showing the house, they're showing this, they're showing that, and four guys get up and they say, I, I ain't going. So why aren't you going? I, veteran guys in the, in the narcotics division, I ain't going. So why aren't you going? I'm a Latin king. What do you mean you're a Latin king? I'm a Latin king. I ain't going, I ain't going to a house with my brothers. And then you start asking yourself, well, how the hell we didn't catch this when you're doing the background? So they are, they're, they're members in, in the departments right now that people don't know. What they're doing now, and, and here, here comes the part that you don't know what you're violating or not. Law enforcement agencies, even the military is doing it now too. When you put an application, should we ask you, are you a gang member? Do you have ties with a gang member? So the, this, it's a big thing right now trying to figure that part out because that's what they're doing, counter surveillance. They're asking their females that are associated gang members, take a job in the court, take a job as a dispatcher. There's documented cases in California, that's what happened. They send the call, they grab a cell phone, hey listen, they go into your house right now, get everything out. You know, raids that they know that the stuff is there, when they get there, there's nothing there. You know, so this is very, is very tricky. MS-13, for example, a lot of the Mexican gangs, what they're doing is telling their guys that no, have no record whatsoever, join the military. Once you join the military, you get free training. Guess what, you're gonna come back to the, the street and you're gonna give training to the same guys. Another thing that you have is weapons. There was a case in uh, San Antonio, have an Air Force base over there, that they stole all kinds of weapons out of uh, the barracks. When they found out, they were members of the Mexican Mafia, but they were enlisted members of the military. So they're everywhere now. Government, everywhere. And yes, they are encouraging them to go to school. How do you approach someone like you feel that maybe there's a gay presence you know, in this area? What's the college here? You don't want to step on toes, but you don't want it to increase or something like that. Well, what kind of methods can you take? Again, I, I, I work a lot with Captain Sheehan in, in UMass, in Dartmouth, and, and they asked me that question. This is what I tell everybody. For us in the street and in the, inside the prison, it's easier. You already more or less know who to target. 
inside of college, you come with a lot of different things. You have fairly young adults, but now you have also the thing behind your back. Okay, am I violating any of these rights? Are they going to call the ACLU? Am I doing something that is going to aggravate the, 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 the trustees? You know, what, so you gotta be you gotta be very careful. What I tell everybody is like you know, in schools, what 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 when I when I have talked to a few people in schools, I tell you, check your classroom every day. Check your classroom every day. Look around the chairs, uh, anything new that you see in the walls that is graffiti or something like that. Figure it out. You more or less you figure out who you have in your class, who's sitting where. Okay, this wasn't here 20 minutes ago. Now it's here. We just let these guys out, and this person, this person was there. Yeah, and you, you watch them, you approach them, you know? You see them doing something. Get in the car, I mean, I don't know what's your policy over here in the campus, how much you have to, you know, you can check a car or anything like that. But in our prison, I, when, I, when I know there's a gangbanger getting released, I watch them. And I watch who's driving the vehicle. And I go to the vehicle, and, hey, how you doing? By the way, can I see your license? Well, I wanna, wanna check you. It's information that we pick. Again, you see somebody wearing a collar, and this is, this is the, the, the benefit of being in a college or, or being in school or anything like that. If you think that somebody's a gang member and they're displaying their collars, it should be a zero tolerance policy that says no gang collars in college. Just get identified. And if you do, perfect, an FIO, field interview. Hey, come over here, I want to talk to you. Are you a gang member? Why are you wearing that? You know? and, and you'll be amazed. It all depends, and just one thing that I learned in this job, it all depends how you talk to people. I've seen, I've talked to the same guy than another person had talked to, and they're screaming at the person, and I come real calm and collected, and hey, what are you doing, hey, listen, I, I want to know this, this, and that. They tell you everything. Once you step up to them with an attitude, that's it, you're done, you lost the person. So be aware of your surroundings. That's, that's what I tell everybody. You know, you gotta be aware. Yeah. That's another thing. That's another thing. I mean, if you're going to do a traffic stop, hey, be careful. Gang member or not gang member. Always got to be careful when you're doing a traffic stop with anybody. In the campus, also the campus, anywhere. But, you know, 80% of the time in school, will they bring a firearm? Uh, they got to be real hardcore. Knife? Yeah, probably. You know, but a firearm inside in a school? Eh, I, I don't see a, a, a big, big thing over there. Uh, what's your staff, I mean, a faculty over here? How many students do you get here a year? Not on the summertime, your busy time. Yeah, we have over 6,000 day and night. And in the summertime, we don't have that many. And they're from everywhere. Yeah, you gotta be careful with, you know, we gotta just, what I tell, watch who's around these people. I'm sorry, you know, and this is one thing that as, as, as law enforcement, they tell you not to do, but as a gang investigator, you always do. You profile. It's not that you're gonna stop this person because you're profiling, but you're gonna look at somebody for what you're trained to look for. The baggy clothes, the collars, shoes that they're wearing, what are they wearing or not. Doesn't mean you're gonna stop them, but it's, it means that you're gonna put a little bit more attention to this person, okay? Let's say, for example, you see somebody walking in here, collars, showing collars, a jacket that could be a crip jacket or it could be a blood jacket. And also, you see him by himself. But two weeks down the line, he comes with three guys in a little Toyota and they're wearing the same collars. What are you going to do? See what I mean? I'm not saying stop that guy and ask him if he's a gang member. But if you see something that is not usual with this person, I will, I will go and investigate. Hey, what's going on? You guys, students in here? Yeah, no? Okay, what are you doing here? They may be looking for somebody. You know what I'm saying? The kid probably had a problem with somebody and he bring his boys to solve the issue. That's what, you know, things like that is, you know, wanna, wanna pay attention to. Okay, have to keep your eyes open. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard. I mean, once if you if, if if at one point you were so committed and you gave hundred percent and you decide all of a sudden and you tell your people, hey, I'm gonna wanna get out of a gang, man. They're gonna look at you like, no, you're not. 
the, you know, what they call, you know, people heard the word, uh, the, the phrase blood in, blood out. You gotta commit a crime of blood, either beat somebody up or your own blood, kill somebody, and that's the same way that you're gonna go. You know? Some gangs, they beat you up till you bleed, and that's it. All the gangs, they kill you. 80% of the time, they'll kill you. <laughs> so what do a lot of these kids do? They turn. Once they see that they're so into it and they don't want to deal with it anymore because it's affecting everybody, they're going to try to turn and they're going to try to become helpful to law enforcement. Why? Because you have the tools to put them somewhere for some specific time, but you got to give something to get something. A lot of them don't want to do it until they see themselves at their corner that, shit, I already asked to go, they don't want to let me go, what should I do now? This is what I have to do. You know? So it, it's hard. And then you have, it, so it, you have the rare case that they tell the guy, hey, go, get out of here. Either the guy's using drugs, he's not following the orders, they don't want to deal with the guy anymore. But then they tell them, you got to get that tattoo out of your body. Now you have a guy, probably a drug addict, has no money. You know? How's he going to get that tattoo out of his arm? And if he doesn't do it a specific amount of time that they tell him to, to do it, They'll beat them up, or they kill them, or they do something. Massachusetts, we don't have a program like that. In California, they do. You're a gang member, you want to you leave your gang, they give you everything. They protect you, they take your tattoos away from you. If they have to relocate you, they relocate you. And that's the other problem. A lot of these kids get relocated like that. They come to this area, they don't get a job, they send them to a project, and then what do you think they're going to do? They're going to go back to what they know, it's the gang life. So, you know, you have, you have a lot of, you know, I know a lot of, we have one guy in one of the conferences that I went that he was a gang member for 15 years with rank, decided to quit, you know, he got lucky, he got relocated and everything, and, and he's been doing fine. He's actually helped law enforcement to develop programs against gangs and stuff like that. But you have other guys that have been good for two or three years and they got to go back because that's all they know. They can't get a job, they can't get, they can go forward. So it's, I would say from 100 people that quit, four do good. The rest go back sooner or later. It's very hard, it's very hard. Again, it's what they know as a culture. Some of these guys are generation. Their parents were gang members, their parents' parents were gang members, or were involved in something like that. That's all they know. They're born in that, they're born into that, to that thing. I have pictures of little kids doing hand signs and stuff four or five year olds. That's what they're teaching them. Sad. That's what it is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How would you go about trying to counteract the development of the gang? Like to keep the young kids? A lot of education. You know, it, it, the question is that I'm the worst person to ask that because my, my my idea into stopping something like that is put more law enforcement out there. That's, that's my idea. Why? But you gotta have a plan, okay? And this is, this is where it comes. You gotta, you gotta have a plan for everything. You gotta have a plan for, okay, you're gonna, it's a strip tip plan. You identify the person. After you identify the person, you see what it is, you do an intervention. You grab the person, you do whatever you have to do to grab them. After you do the intervention, now you gotta, do the civic side of it, which is, are you gonna get out of this gang? Are you gonna, you, try, you gotta help the person. You can't just grab him, put him in jail, bye, see you later. It, it don't work like that. Because again, they're gonna come back to the same thing. If they really wanna change, then that's when you bring them to the other part and, okay, this is how we're gonna help you. The problem is, is that we're stuck in one part. We react. It's about it. There's no prevention, and there's no plan after the reaction. We're just in the reaction plan. All right, what are we gonna do? Well. That's a guy that are gangbangers, we're gonna watch him for 15 days and when they start selling drugs, we're gonna go in there and grab them. And what are you gonna do after that? We're gonna send them to jail and keep them there. Okay, so why don't we start making programs to tell the kids, hey, this is what gangs are all about. This is what you do, this is what's gonna happen. These are the consequences, you know. And another thing, it takes money, okay. There's more money on the reaction part of the, of the plan than on the prevention part of the plan. If you give me more money on the prevention plan, it will work perfect. But you have to target a specific group of people, which is the kids in, 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 from junior high to elementary. After junior high, they're gonna do whatever the heck they wanna do. 
and you gotta target them after they finish their incarceration, after they get arrested. Everybody has to work together. You know, my philosophy is if you don't work together, you can't solve the problem. You gotta drop all your egos to the side, especially in law enforcement, we have a lot of egos. You know, you have departments that can't work with other departments, and, and it don't work. You should bring everybody, you should bring DSS together, you should bring every department in the area together and work together, you know? But it don't happen. They say there's no money in the cure, there's money in the drugs. <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> the same thing. Any other questions? Can I have one? Yes, ma'am. Basically, these gangs will make up of their own. I, I feel that the, the gangs, they're more into getting back in trouble, gang to gang, than to target a regular person. Well, I gotta say this, we've been lucky here in, in this area. We've been very lucky. And we've been very lucky because just what you just said. A lot of these gangs are fighting each other. They're not fighting everybody. You go to places like Hamden, New Jersey. You go to places to Pen uh, like Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. You go to places like California. They don't care. My little island of Puerto Rico, they don't care. All they care is about their territory. If you're in the middle and I gotta kill somebody because you're in the middle, you're going. It's a business for them. Over here, it is a business, but it's more of personal pride and territory. A lot of the guys, Fall River, New Bedford, all the shootings that we see over here, they're all more about that. I asked one gangbanger in New Bedford that question one time. I asked him that, so why is it between you guys all the time? You know, you know, what happens if somebody shoots a cop or something like that? And what he told me was, his answer was, we're not stupid. We're dumb, but we're not stupid. And we're like, why? He said, because if we shoot a cop or we kill a civilian that is not involved in, in the family business type of thing of, of the gang, we'll be dead. And they're right. They shoot a cop in the Fall River, New Bedford, anywhere. And he's a gangbanger. You're going to know that all the cops in the area are going to come down and they're going to do what they have to do to find this person. And they're going to target them. And they're going to target them more than they're targeting right now. So they're not, they're not that dumb. They know exactly what they're doing. Anything else? I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to once again thank Julio.